Thank you so much for allowing me to worship with you, and thank you so much for giving me this chance to uh, bring a word of testimony and the word of God. Uh, as uh, Pastor Eric mentioned, I teach at Emmanuel University in Oradea, Romania, is a, a conservative evangelical university, and uh, we are very honored um, by the Lord to allow us to uh, be part of this great work in the country of Romania, and not only. Uh, Emmanuel University has over 2,800 graduates in 41 countries around the world, and uh, we are so blessed to see some of our graduates literally pastoring churches in diaspora, in Europe, and not only, but literally around the world. I also bring you greetings from the church that I pastor, a small village church in the village of Mirlo, is just outside of Oradia. We have a small congregation, but uh, they wanted to make sure that when I, uh, I'm here with you, to pass on their greetings. Now, I do not know how much you know about Romania, having Romanians in your congregation, but for 45 years, Romania has been under severe persecution. I'm talking about the church. For many, many years, the Romanian churches have been under severe persecution. There were many times when communism have tried to destroy Christianity by destroying the name of God. Uh, we are not literally too much allowed to talk about the name of God. In fact, I remember being uh, just a small child and then growing up that I have never seen the word of God uh, in any printing in the newspapers or in the media. And every time um, I was talking in school with the, my colleagues and with the professors, they were kind of very, very careful in talking about the name of God. There were many times when Christianity was tried to be destroyed by destroying the word of God. Uh, it was illegally at that time to smuggle in the Bibles, and I remember people paying a one month salary uh, to be able to purchase a copy of the Word of God. Many years ago, in 1980s, the American ambassador to Romania was a gentleman by the name of David Vandenberg. David Vandenberg, the American ambassador, told us the story that while he was in Bucharest, one afternoon, he went to his office, to, to the bathroom, and he spotted some Bible words on a piece of toilet paper. He did some research and he inquired and he found out that basically all the Bibles were supposed to be smuggled into the country. If they were confiscated, they were turned into toilet paper. Another way in which communism have tried to destroy Christianity in Romania was literally bulldozing the building and destroy the leadership development of our churches. For example, the Romanian Baptist Convention in 1987, 88, they had about 700 churches. They had only 130 pastors. 85% of them were past the age of retirement. That's why in Romania, still today, we have many, many churches that have no pastors, literally presence on every Sunday. We have pastors that pastor two or three or even five churches. I was telling Pastor Eric yesterday morning at breakfast that my grandfather was a blacksmith by trade. He pastored 11 churches. Literally, he would preach one service, one sermon, go to the next church, and then go to the next church. So every Sunday, he will cover three to four churches. Now, I know that some of you are not very familiar with the persecution of the church. When I think of the persecuted church, I look into the New Testament, and in particular, I want us to open our scriptures to the book of Philippians, chapter 4. There is a church in the New Testament that was established by Paul, actually, in 52 after Christ. If you remember the story, Paul was in his second missionary journey. He was preaching the gospel in Asia Minor. One night he had the vision. Someone stood and said, come over to Macedonia and help us. 
The scripture tells us that Paul and the missionary team, they went over to Macedonia. And if you remember, when they got there in the city of Philippi, they went by the river where some women were praying. One of them, by the name of Lydia, invited them to come into her, her house. And the church was established, we can say, the church was established in 52 after Christ in her home. Now, 10 years later, while Paul is in prison in Rome, he writes a letter to this church. We have it as the book of Philippians. Uh, we have it as four chapters. I do not know exactly how many verses. But there are many reasons why Paul wrote this letter. First of all, in chapter 4, verse 16, Paul says to the church, a big thank you. In chapter 4, verse 16, this is what Paul writes. For even in Thessalonica, you sent aid once and again for my necessities. We know what happened. While Paul was in Philippi preaching the gospel, he had a desire to go over to Thessalonica and preach the gospel. We are told in the scripture that they went over and for three weekends he preached the gospel. During that time, the church in back home, we will say, in Philippi, have sent once and again something unto his necessities. We do not know if it was a monetary help or just material like food and so on. But Paul writes to them and says, oh, for even in Thessalonica, you send aid once and again for my necessity. So it's a way for him to say thank you so much. Another reason why Paul wrote this letter is found in chapter 2, beginning in verse 25. There was a young man by the name of Epaphroditus. The scripture tells us in chapter 2, beginning verse 25, that he was very ill and he was close to die. And now Paul was sending him back to the church and kind of wanted to let the church know what happened to him. And he says, Paul writes in verse 26, for since he was longing for you all and was distressed because you had heard that he was sick. For indeed he was sick almost unto death. But God had mercy on him and I not only on him but on me also lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. So there's a second reason why Paul writes this letter is to inform the church about this young man. However, there's another reason why Paul writes this letter, and I believe is the most important reason, as that, and that is found in verses 29 and 30th in chapter 1. Paul writes and says, For to you it has been granted on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake, having the same conflict which you saw in me, and now here is in me. I believe not only I, but also most of the commentators believe that this is the most important reason why Paul writes this letter. Paul writes these letters to the church in the city of Philippi, a church that was going persecution and was facing suffering and sorrow and pain. Now, the church historians will tell us that the persecution started in 62-64. If you read this chapter, if you read this book, you realize that Paul from prison writes to the church and says, for unto you it has been granted in behalf of Christ not only to believe in him and what a blessing, but also to suffer for his sake. In other words, what we understand from here is that Paul was in, it, the church was in its Ethiopian stages of persecution and Paul writes to encourage the church during the time of suffering persecution and sorrow and pain. So this is the message that he has for the church. Chapter 4, verse 1. As Paul writes the church, he tells them in chapter 4, verse 1, what are we to do when the persecution and suffering and sorrow comes? Chapter 4, verse 1 in our text, the scripture says, Therefore, my beloved and longed for brethren, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, beloved. In other words, Paul says, yes, persecution is coming. The suffering of the church is here. But as believers, we are commanded to stand fast in the Lord, to stand firm in the Lord. 
Now, there's a reason why we are to do that. The verse says, therefore. So we know from studying the scriptures and doing the correct exegesis of the text, we have to look at the immediate context. What is he talking about? Therefore, what? So beginning in verse 18 in chapter 3, he talks about some enemies of the cross of Christ, and he describes them. And then something that really comes out as we are reading chapter 3, verse 20, the scripture says this, for our citizenship is in heaven, from which we eagerly, so also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord, the, Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body that he might be confirmed to his glorious body according to the working by which he is able and even to subdue all things to himself, therefore. So Paul says, yes, persecution is present, suffering is there. However, we are to stand fast. We are to stand firm because all of this suffering and sorrow and pain is just temporarily because our citizenship is in heaven. So because our citizenship is in heaven, because all of these suffering and sorrows and trials are just for a while, we are then to decide to stand fast and stand firm. The scripture in our text, beginning in verse 2, all the way to verse 6, gives us some principles that will enable us to stand fast during the time of persecution and suffering and sorrow and trials and tribulation. First of all, Paul says, to be able to stand fast, the church must have unbroken unity. To be able to stand fast during all of those trials and tribulation and suffering, we have to learn to live a life of unbroken unity. Read with me verses two and three. I implore Judea and I implore Sintik to be of the same mind in the Lord. And I urge you also, true companion, help these women who labored with me in the gospel with Clement and also and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. So Paul writes and wants to encourage the church to stand fast, learning to live a life of unbroken unity. We do not know exactly what happened, but two women in the church for unknown reason came to a point where they were disagreeing, probably even to a point where the church was split. Paul writes and says this, make sure that in this letter he says, I want them to understand how important unity is in the life of the church. I implore Judea and Sintik. And in order for them to understand and for him to underline the importance of unity, he uses here, I implore as being translated, I beg. Is someone who is literally uh, uh, kneeling and begging his father for some favor. Paul says, I beg you. It's more than, please take a note. Uh, by the way, let me mention to you how important unity. No, he says, I beg you. Probably this is the strongest form of request. He humbles himself to the point of begging them to be of the same mind. See, Paul understands something that we also understand. There are two ways in which Satan attacks the church, from outside in and from inside out. In fact, in chapter 3, verses 18, when he talks about the enemy of the cross of Christ, are not the outside enemies, are the people among themselves. However, when the church is persecuted, the church is persecuted now from outside in. And Paul says there are two reasons and two ways in which Satan attacks the church from inside out and from outside in. And what he says in order to, for them to be able to stand fast is you must live a life of unbroken unity. You know, then and now, the church was a minority. Paul says, do not use your energies to fight among them yourselves, but you use all of this energy to find one common enemy, and that is Satan. 
Too many times we fight among ourselves and Satan is using that. And instead of being uh, equipped and being ready and being having all the energy that we need to fight the enemy, we fight among ourselves. I like that motto that you have as a church. Uh, many, many nations, but one, one family. So Paul says it is important for you to understand unity. And he has some arguments. Argument number one, if unity was not important in the life of the church, Paul, the church will never address this problem. Now, go with me and try to see the scenario. Paul is in prison suffering for Christ. By now he's an old man suffering there. Why would I bring more sorrow to his life? By telling him, by the way, you know, the church that you passed and the church that you ministered, uh, we are at the point of splitting ourselves and there's so much disagreement. So why would you add more sorrow to him? The church realized this is something beyond our control. So let's write our pastor and see what he has to say. Argument number two, not only that the church writes to Paul, but Paul writes back to the church. If unity was not important in the life of the church as we were to stand fast, Paul will never address this problem in the letter. But he knew very well then years after 21st century, not, not in Copenhagen, but in other churches, there will be some people they will fight among themselves and will not understand the importance of unity. So Paul wanted for the church to know to have it in writing. Argument number three, not only that uh, the church writes to Paul, not only that Paul writes to church, but also argument number three, Paul involves the church. Read with me verse 3. I, I urge you also, true companion, help these women who labor with me in the gospel. So now he involves the church. Do you know what was the distinctive element of the first century church? The unity of the believers. Acts 2.42. The scripture says they, said all, they had all things in, in common. They had all things in common, so the distinctive element of the Christian church, the first Christian church, the first century church, was the unity of the believers. It was December 16, 1989. A small church in the city of Timisoara. They were coming together to worship. That Sunday morning, the secret services from the city of Timisoara came to the pastor and told the pastor that that afternoon after the service, he will be arrested and taken to jail. It was a small reformed Hungarian reformed church in that city. While they were telling Pastor Laszlo Tokes that he was going to be arrested, someone overheard that discussion, went to all the 21 evangelical churches in the city of Timisoara told the pastors, the leaders of the church, this afternoon, our pastor is going to be arrested. Two o'clock in the afternoon, people came to arrest Pastor Tokesh. When they got to his house, there were hundreds of people that were making a chain of human bodies around his house. They went back to their headquarters. They didn't know what to do. They came back at five o'clock. There were more people down there protecting him, making a chain of human bodies. Then by 10 o'clock in the evening in the Opera Plaza there in the city of Timisoara, there were over 100,000 people chanting down with Ceausescu, Christ is alive. Down with Ceausescu, Christ is alive. Chuck Olson in the book that he wrote entitled The Body, I believe in, on page 72 tells this story. That night, as they were praying, Pastor Peter Dugulescu stood up, led them in the Lord's Prayer as everybody was kneeling. It was the beginning of what we call the overthrow of communism in our country. Oh yeah, probably people talk about some other ways that uh, they try to do it. 
but literally started with one church that said enough is enough. Small congregation that understood how important it is during the time of suffering and trials and tribulation to be able to stand fast is to learn to live a life of unity. If I pray something for you this morning, is that as you minister in this great city, may you learn to live a life of unity. And indeed, many nations, one family. Principle number two, to stand fast, the church must not only learn to live a life of unbroken unity, but also a life of unshakable assurance of his presence. Read with me in verse five. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. We're talking about the presence of the Lord. In, able, in order to be able to stand fast, we must learn to live a life of unshakable assurance of his presence. There's that, this expression there, the Lord is at hand. Now, in the original, when we look at this expression, most of the times we translate it as talking about the second coming of the Lord. So logically, if we understand what the church went through, logically they will we'll say, yes, it makes sense. When we talk about the Lord is at hand, we are talking about the second coming of the Lord. Imagine this. Jesus is his with disciples. He goes up to heaven and says, I'm going to prepare your place. And after I go and prepare your place, I'll come back and I will take you. So where will I be? So you will be also. Every morning, the persecuted church, the brethren, the sisters, they are persecuted for their faith. Probably every night they went to bed asking and praying, Lord, would you come back? Every morning, they will probably get up and look into the sky and say, Lord, is this the day? Has been some years now since the Lord went up to heaven. So their expectation was, oh, the Lord is coming back. It makes sense. The Lord is at hand. However, in the original, this expression, the Lord is at hand, does not refer too much of the time frame it refers to space frame. So when we say the Lord is at hand, it is the idea that the Lord is so present that at the reach of my hand, I can touch him. The psalmist says, the Lord is the shadow on my right arm, my right hand. So when we read this text, we say, yes, we are commanded to stand fast to stand firm learning to live a life of unbroken unity but also unshakable assurance of his presence in other words knowing that he is with us not only when we are on the top of the mountains but also when we are in the deepest of the valleys the bible says i'm with you always i am with you always and he's talking about the presence of the Lord. Let me ask you this. As you are facing trials and tribulation and suffering and sorrow and pain, isn't this comfortable and is a comfort to know that it doesn't matter what, the Lord is there. Many years ago, a Romanian preacher by the name of Richard Wurbrandt was put in jail, he was in jail for 14 years. Two of those in solitary confinement. Years ago, I took my youth and we went to see the place where he was in prison and we walked into the place where he was in solitary confinement for two years. He was chained in one room with a huge metal heavy door that I, I don't think he could open being there for so many years and and so there was a, a chain, a place that he was chained down there. 14 years he was in prison for his faith. He was released from prison and went to United States and he started the Voice of the Martyrs. And in 1992, while I was in Chicago at the Romanian Baptist Church, he was preaching. I had a chance to visit with him. I went to talk to him, he was sitting, 
preaching from sitting down. He was old now, and so I approached him and I was shaking. A hero of our faith. Uh, there's no Romanian believer that do not know of him and his sufferings. And I was approaching him, I was shaking. I'm meeting a man, 14 years in jail for his faith, beaten and persecuted. And as I approached him, I asked him, I said, Pastor Vurbran, I have one question. What was it? 14 years in prison, solitary confinement. What was it that gave you the strength to go on and move on? He looked at me and he said something that I'll never forget. The sweet aroma of the fellowship with Jesus. Every morning, every day, every night, the sweet aroma of his fellowship with Jesus. In fact, let me tell you another story. We are going to have the Lord's Supper. They have been in prison for five years, him and other believers. After five years, they were allowed to meet briefly for one hour on an Easter Sunday morning. When these believers got together after five years in prison, Richard Wurbrand and some others said, brethren, we've been here for five years. We haven't seen each other. Who knows if we'll ever see each other again? But today is the resurrection day. Why don't we celebrate the Lord's Supper? They're in prison. They have no bread and no wine. But Richard Wurbrand took nothing and he blessed nothing. He broke nothing and they took the Lord's Supper. And then Richard Wurbrand took nothing and they blessed nothing. They drank nothing and they took the Lord's Supper. Some of them died there in prison, never being able to come out and have the celebration of the Lord's Supper. Richard Wurbrand said the sweet aroma of the fellowship with Jesus. Persecution will come, suffering will come, trials and tribulations will come. I do not know if persecution will come on your church as it has been in Romania and many other places. But I know for sure that suffering will come, trials and tribulations will come. And I pray that whenever the suffering comes, that you will be able to stand fast and stand firm, learning to live a life of unbroken unity and also the shakable assurance of his presence. Thank you and God bless you.